Okay. okay. Uh, so today we're going to learn about entropy and free energy. And this is my favorite lecture. And entropy just means chaos and disorder. So you're going to learn how the universe favors chaos and disorder and how the universe is constantly expanding. And then how free energy tells us if things will happen or not happen. So if there is free energy available to do work, then a reaction occurs. If there's not energy available to do work, then the reaction doesn't occur. So we're going to talk about spontaneity and whether or not things are favorable, like they will happen, or not favorable, they won't happen. And that will depend on heat, chaos, and overall how much energy is available. So all these words are sort of new and make no sense, but we'll sort it out. So, oops, all right. Thermodynamically favored processes can be abbreviated TFP. So if you write that on my quiz or my test, I'll be fine with it. I know what you mean. It means that this happens without any assistance from the outside system. So the reaction is spontaneous, meaning it will happen on its own. Uh, so for example, water evaporates at 25 degrees Celsius. If it's just sitting here, it has some sort of vapor pressure and it's going to evaporate. So that is thermodynamically favored. Iron rusts in the presence of oxygen and water. Just sitting outside, eventually your bike will rust, right? Eventually. And then sodium chloride does dissolve in water. All of these things, especially this one, just because something is spontaneous and will occur doesn't mean that it's going to occur fast. So this is not a kinetics lecture. We'll do kinetics at a separate time. But if it's spontaneous, that doesn't mean fast. Sometimes students confuse that, so I would write that down. FAST is a kinetics lecture. All right, so something that is not thermodynamically favored means that it's going to require assistance from the outside in order for it to occur. Um, water does not boil at 75 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere. What temperature does water boil at? 100. We need to make sure we know that. So how can I get water to boil at 75 degrees Celsius? What is the process of boiling, by the way? Let's remember that. It's when what equals what? The vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. So what could I do to get this? Go ahead, Nelson lower the pressure, the atmospheric pressure. So if I'm up high on a mountain, right, I could potentially get this to uh, boil at 75 degrees. Or you use a pressure cooker, right? Um, water does not freeze at 15 degrees Celsius. So this is not a thermodynamically favored process. Um, this is showing you that iron oxide, you can't get it to unrust, um, but you can use that process that I showed you yesterday where you add carbon and you can get the oxide to be removed by adding really, really high temperatures. Remember we did that through Hess's law. We could figure out that we can get high temperatures if we combine the carbon there. Uh, so you could, that doesn't necessarily happen, but if you add in heat, you could get it to happen. So your bike's not going to unrust on its own, but you can get iron oxide and convert it to iron by the addition of heat. So non-thermodynamically favored can still happen, but with the assistance from something else. Uh, so these two processes, the process that's thermodynamically favored in one direction will not be thermodynamically favored in the other direction. So liquid water going to solid at negative 10 degrees is obviously thermodynamically favored. But going the opposite way, solid to a liquid, is obviously not thermodynamically favored. So that's true for all reactions. So if I write up a reaction A plus B goes to C, right, and I say that that's thermodynamically favored, that process will happen spontaneously, then going from C to B plus A will not happen spontaneously. So we're really applying this for reactions, not, necessar not necessarily just understanding that ice is not going to unmelt at 10 degrees, negative 10 degrees. So this says that nature um, or exothermic reactions are often thermodynamically favored. So when you have an exothermic reaction, you are releasing heat into your surroundings, right? And so it says that nature tends to favor processes that cause a reduction in energy. So I'm reducing energy in my products because I'm releasing kinetic energy. So the amount of potential energy stored in my products, remember we did this, is lower. If I have an exothermic process, remember, I have high kinetic energy 
in my products and low potential energy. Do you remember that? So in nature, we try to have a lower cause of reduction in energy. So we have lower potential energy stored in the bones in the products, and kinetic energy is released in the form of heat. So that would be why exothermic is favored. Uh, the bonds in the products contain less energy than the bonds in the reactants, and the excess energy is released as heat. So right now, a key thing that you just learned is that negative delta H is thermodynamically favored. So I'm going to write down for you, because this is super important as you learn this lesson, that you know what favorable things are. So in other words, delta H right now, I just said to you, a negative, which is exothermic, is always favorable because that's putting out energy into the surroundings. So this would be exothermic. Favorable means that we want this to happen. We want our reactions to be negative delta H values. An endothermic reaction can be thermodynamically favored, but it's typically not. Like, if we're going to look at a reaction, we won't assume that it's thermodynamically favored. We have to sort of evaluate a few things, but it's possible that it could be. So it says evaporation is thermodynamically favored, going from a liquid to gas. That's an input of heat, though, right? That's not an exothermic reaction. That's an input, so it's endo, but this still will happen spontaneously. It's still thermodynamically favored. And then when we have propane going from a liquid to a gas, that's also an endothermic process. Uh, dissolving soluble compounds is thermodynamically favored. We go from sodium chloride, goes from its solid state into its individual ions. And again, that's an endothermic process. So all of these things uh, happen favorably, spontaneous, right? Doesn't mean fast, but spontaneous. Just as a side note for this one, for propane, this is an endothermic process. Where do you use propane? Do you know? Yeah? In your grill. In your grill. And if you've ever taken your propane tank and as it's turned on, as it's converting from the liquid to the gas, like on the surface of the tank, if you put your hand on that tank, what should it feel like? It should feel cold because it's taking in energy from its surroundings to convert it into the gas phase. So your propane tank actually gets cool as it's um, fueling your grill. So some things, most of the time, we want our reactions to be exothermic. And I'll explain this in a little bit too why. But you can still have thermodynamically favored processes even though they might be endothermic. And the reasons why we'll get to later have to do with how much energy is involved in that system. So there's going to be some deciding factors near the end. All right, entropy. Entropy really is chaos. I like to use the word chaos because when I was in school and in college, my professors used the word chaos instead of disorder, but it still means the same thing. Uh, so this is sort of hard to get in your head. Like, we're going to learn science based on chaos and how much disorder there is. So the more disorder we have, the more favorable this is. So a positive value for S, which is entropy, delta S is entropy, is favorable. So the universe wants more disorder. The more chaos there is in molecules, and there's so many examples we can use for this, and this goes way beyond my little lecture of thermodynamics in chemistry class. But the universe wants more disorder and more chaos. So whatever conditions we can create to create more disorder is favorable. So those values will be positive to create more disorder. So delta A S is the, the chaos in your products minus the chaos in your reactants. If there's more chaos in your products, you would have a positive value here. So now we're going to write down that we want delta S to be positive. So this means more chaos or disorder. So if you think about the evaporation process for delta S, and we'll look at this in a few slides too, but I'll just mention it now. If you're evaporating, you're going from a liquid, so you have molecules that can vibrate, they're moving around, they have some, um, you know, they can move in straight lines, they can rotate around each other. They're not super free, but they're definitely more free than a solid would be. So I have my liquid here. 
But then I go into the gas phase, I've evaporated, and now I'm all over. So the combinations of this kind of rotating around itself and moving around, compared to all the combinations of the molecules doing this, is way more disordered. Do you understand that? So when you think of disorder, you can think of it almost like knickknacks or little toys. Um, like think of a bunch of little toy cars. And you have your little toy cars on the shelves, right? The number of arrangements, they're all different. They're not the same. The number of arrangements of the way you can arrange your cars on that shelf will increase with the more cars you have, right? Like I can put the red car, the yellow car, the blue car, the green car, and then I can rearrange that. Like I think these are called, is it factorials in math class? Something like that. In that sense, you can think of it that way, that there's more rearrangements, more chaos. The more cars I add, the more rearrangements I have. So if you think about your molecules moving around, now they have way more movement when they go into the gas phase. So you can think of, uh, that's just one example of evaporation. Um, so if it becomes a positive value, if S is positive, then it will always be an increase in entropy. All right, here are some kind of silly examples, non-chemistry related, related of how entropy increases in the universe. So you see this stuff happen all the day. If entropy wasn't increasing in the universe, everything would be sort of perfect for you. Your house gets dirty. So when your house gets dirty, where does the dirt go? Everywhere? It's not like it's just in this neat little pile in the left-hand corner of the kitchen and every time you need to clean up, you go and sweep up that little left-hand pile, right? Dirt is everywhere. So you are cleaning your house to create more order, right? So in a sense, the cleaning of your house is a negative delta S value, right? Because you're taking disorder and you're making it orderly. You go in your bedroom and you clean up all of your stuff. Now your room's more ordered. But you physically are using energy to clean your room, right? And the amount of energy that you're giving off, the heat that you're giving off is exothermic, correct? So that process that is overcoming this orderly process allows your house to get clean or your room to get clean. So there's order and then there's disorder. You've created more disorder to the surroundings, to the universe, by you giving off heat as you're cleaning your room. If you make a stir fry, so that's like you put some vegetables in, you have your broccoli, your cashews, your chicken, your teriyaki sauce. It's not like neat little piles around the pan. No matter what you do mixing it, they all go to the same little piles. There's chaos. There's disorder in that. If you're trying to get your lawn, although you guys probably don't do this, but you know there's all those little tall little weed grasses. My husband's always trying to get them out of the lawn. You have to put energy in to get those out. You have to pull each one out. So all of these, if you spill milk, you're never going to get all that milk back into that glass without dirt in there, right? So the universe favors this disorderly system. That's what all these examples are showing you is that... Uh, entropy increases in the universe. And these have to do with these two laws. So the first law of thermodynamics is that energy is conserved. We know that one already. But the second law of thermodynamics is that the entropy of the universe is constantly increasing. So chaos and disorder is expanding. If it were contracting, then that would mean that everything would be orderly. Always. But things aren't orderly. You get that, right? Your room doesn't stay clean. The dirt doesn't stay in a little pile. Everything is always increasing in disorder. So the entropy of the universe is constantly expanding. And that often has to do with heat just being released into the atmosphere and to the surroundings. So here are some processes that we're going to use constantly for our reactions where delta S is greater than zero. So what you're going to end up doing for values is you can write delta S with a positive sign for yourself as you're kind of evaluating things, or you can just write delta S is greater than zero. Often I'll just do this so that no one's confused, but greater than zero does mean positive. All right, so these are positive processes. If you go from melting, you're from solid to liquid, right? That's more disorder. I just explained that one before. Vaporization, liquid to gas. So the movement of your particles increases your disorder. Reactions where the products are in the same phase as the reactants, but contain more particles than the reactants. This means more moles of products. So you literally are going to add your coefficients on the product side and compare them to the coefficients on the reactant side. 
So add coefficients on product side and compare to the reactants. This is only true if they're in the same phase. If they're in a different phase, then it would be obvious that you would get more disorder from a solid going to a liquid or a liquid going to a gas. That trumps how many particles you have. So phase changes are uh, What's the word that I wanted to use? I always say trumps, but now that he's our president, I feel like it's awkward to keep using that word. So I came up with a better word. I thought it was in this class. Yeah. More predominant. No, I would say it's like surpasses. Surpasses, I think that's the word. Phase changes are, uh, I don't know, are more significant. That's a good word are more significant than uh, coefficient changes or number of particles. That's probably a better way to say that. So immediately when you look at a reaction, you're looking for are the reactants solid, liquid, and then are the products liquid gases. If that's occurring, it doesn't matter how many particles you have because you have so much more disorder when they can move around. But if they're all solids on the left side and all solids on the right side, then you start counting your coefficients up. All right, making most solutions is going to be uh, uh, an increase in disorder, but you guys already know that sometimes solutions can cause more order, and I'll talk about that too. Adding heat to a system and then increasing the volume of a gas. So I'm going to go through these examples um, in the next few slides. Okay, delta S is positive when melting. So you have your water molecules that they're all lined up due to what kind of intermolecular forces? Dipole-dipole forces. They're lined up. They can't really move. So there's something called like uh, transitional relation to one another. Transitional means moving in lines. They can't translate. When they're stuck in that solid, they're just stuck there. There's just vibrations. They're just moving like this. But once you get into a liquid, they actually can move past each other and find other dipole-dipole forces around. So this has a very small s. Even as a solid, it still has possible arrangements in its vibration. So this is a small positive s, but when you go to the liquid, it's a very much larger s because it's disorganized. Now it can move around. Um, let me talk about it in this slide. The only time that, you're, that you could possibly get less organization when you uh, dissolve a solid is when you have a specific type of particle. Do you remember which one that is? The, the slide that I showed you was we were like this and uh, we had a, like a negative cathode. We had cathode, anode, positive, negative there. And we put in, I think it was like cesium and like, uh, I don't know, maybe I had like iron or something like that in there. Do you remember that one? And I asked you which one was going to get to the end the fastest. Do you remember that? Yeah. What's the reason why? Do you remember which one? So we were talking a little bit. Most of the time you thought it was about size, but this is in water. So if it had nothing to do with water, then we would just go based on size, right? How fast it can get to the other end has to do with its molar mass. Right. So small, highly positive charged ions, cations, remember, can drag water molecules down and slow the arrangement of the water molecules. Because if this is really small and highly positive charged, it's going to have a whole bunch of water molecules around this, whereas this one is just dragging a few water molecules, we'll say, around it, and it can get to the end faster. So small, high positive charge ions drag H2O molecules and decrease the entropy of that system. Because now the water molecules have more order to them. They were moving around freely, now they have more order to them. So most often we'll say going to a liquid does increase disorder, but sometimes when it drags more water molecules around, that overall process can decrease it. Does that make sense? Great. All 
All right, delta S is positive when vaporizing. So I already explained this to you. Low uh, entropy when it's in a liquid, very high entropy because you have much, much more uh, disorder. All right, so this is an interesting slide. This has a little bit of history for you here. And we know that I'm not good at any history facts, but this one I like. All right, so this is delta S is positive when pro products have more particles in them. So we, first of all, we have liquid going to gas, 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 gas. So immediately you would say that this process delta S is positive. It's favorable, right? But you can also note that we have four molecules, and this is nitroglycerin. Do you know what nitroglycerin is? It's that thing in like all the cowboy movies that makes everything explode and kills a ton of people. Right? It's sort of like how we got our railroads and built roads and made cities as we blew up mountains using nitroglycerin. So think about how come this is so explosive. You go from four moles of liquid, which is a relatively small amount, to 29 molecules that are in the gas phase in under a second. When this reaction occurs, so either heat or a fuse is lit, immediately, bam, it goes to 29 molecules of gas. So that it makes an enormous amount of pressure and a lot of heat, and therefore you get an explosion. So um, not only is it the gas, but increasing the number of moles gives you a major increase in the possible arrangements of your entropy. So always changing from liquid to gas is positive, but also the number of particles would give, make it positive. All right, so here's my history lesson for you. Nitroglycerin, and I don't know if I'll get it all right because I just read about this stuff, um, was used by the Nobel family. So where the Nobel Prize came from was from Alfred Nobel, and his family used nitroglycerin. They had factories, and they were a main supplier for nitroglycerin. And so during this time, people were, that were using nitroglycerin for all different reasons were just being killed. Like if they were using it, they were shipping it to a different location. It was on a ship. Some of it would leak out, and all of a sudden... You would have a little bit of heat supplied to it from whatever reasons, and it would explode and kill people on the ship that were transporting it. Uh, they would be carrying it on their, you know, on the back of a cart with horses and a whole bunch of people, and it would explode. So the reasons why this would explode spontaneously on its own is because this decomposes spontaneously. In other words, it just happens, not fast, but it does decompose over time. So if you have this in a barrel with a lid, What's going to happen to your lid as it's going into the gas phase? It's going to push your lid off, right? Because you have built up a pressure, and when the pressure builds up to some degree, it's going to push the lid off. And so as it pushes the lid off, now it starts to leak. And now it's on the ground, or it's wherever it is where it shouldn't be, and people don't know it, and then it can explode. Another reason why, too, that this could be a problem and why it was exploding around um, people were because... Often the nitroglycerin wasn't pure, so it would be made with different acids, and the acids would start to corrode the containers that they were in, and then the containers would get little holes in it, and then uh, the nitroglycerin would leak out. All right, so all of this is tell you that the reason why Alfred Nobel got so wealthy is because he decided to change nitroglycerin into a solid form. So this happened after his warehouse had a huge explosion and his younger brother died in this explosion. So finally, he decided, let's make this into something that's safer, because we still need to use it. So he turned it into what you know as dynamite. So he took like little shells, essentially, uh, and compacted it into this liquid and made almost like a gel material so that it, was, it wouldn't decompose as quickly because the molecules were further apart from one another. And then it was easier to transport because it was in a solid. So... He makes dynamite, he gets super, super wealthy, his whole family is wealthy, he's carrying on this legacy. I think he had 355 inventions. The most notable one was uh, dynamite. And so at this time, another brother of his dies and the obituary comes out, but the paper who wrote the obituary thought that he died. And so the obituary that he was reading was about himself and the title was The Merchant of Death is Dead. Get it? The merchant of death, meaning he's the one who invented dynamite that kills all these people, and now he's dead. So the merchant of death is dead. So after reading this article, you can imagine he probably felt a little down on himself, like this is what his legacy is going to be, is that he killed people. And so the Nobel Prize was invented. 
And that's why he started this whole process. He changed his will. He took all the money that he had made and turned it into something that would be good to award people in science an award for doing something good. And so now his legacy is fantastic, right? We all know about the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, and we all think it's a wonderful thing because he turned around this dynamite thing and made it for good. Great lesson. You should be in this. <gasps> That's a wonderful compliment. Thank you. I think I saw you closing your eyes a little bit, but that's okay. Not me. I think some history is certainly interesting, like that. I mean, the ones you deliver I Thank you. It's on video, so if you want to watch it again, I might keep it in the lecture for you. Maybe. Bonus lesson. All right, so delta S is positive usually when making solutions with solids and or liquids. All right, so you take a solid, you dump it into water, you dissolve it, and then it becomes more disordered. This question shows up constantly on the AP exam, and this is what it'll say. It won't say anything else. It'll say something like blah, 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 sodium chloride I'll use is dissolved uh, in water. Okay, and then it'll give you the rest of the sentence. And then it'll ask you, which we're going to do in a little bit, uh, is this process thermodynamically favored? It'll give you some other information. It's just that you guys skip over this word dissolved. It always shows up. If I say something is dissolved, then immediately you say to yourself, oh, dissolved means delta S is positive. Because otherwise you're going to be looking through the question and you're going to be trying to figure out, is S positive or negative? I don't know. It didn't give me enough information. It's always in the word dissolved. If something's dissolved, it's positive. Uh, so you end up with certainly more disorder when your ions are free to move around in that solution. Uh, delta S is negative when making solutions with liquids and gases. So think about this. You have a gas that can go into water and dissolve. How does that happen? How does oxygen dissolve in water? What intramolecular forces? You all need to know these. Like O2, is that polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar, so it's only dipole induced dipole. It only has London dispersion forces on it, right? So if you have a nonpolar substance with water, which is a polar substance, you get dipole induced dipole. So the oxygen or whatever gaseous molecules come in and they dissolve into water. What happens to the gas particles? Do they increase in entropy or decrease? They're moving around like this and now they have to go in water. Certainly a decrease, right? So when you put gases into liquids, it is a decrease in entropy and so you have a negative value for that. You could, however, mix gases with gases. So when you have a gas plus a gas mixture, We'll call that a mixture, but it's a solution, right? You can still call that a solution. Uh, when you mix them together, would that be an increase or decrease in entropy? An increase, why? More arrangements. More arrangements of the gas particles. So delta S here would be posit positive because there's more arrangements of particles. So you just have to look at what the question is offering you and try to figure out yourself if S is positive or if S is negative. Uh, and those arrows up there, what are those for? Yeah? Indicate movement. They're called what from physics? Velocity vectors, right? So big arrows mean lots of movement, and small arrows mean very little movement. All right, we have done uh, heating and cooling curves again. This is sort of like that curve. It's just showing you that as you're going from a solid to a liquid to a gas, the temperature is increasing, except when you get to the delta, the fusion point and the vaporization point, temperature doesn't change. Why? Energy is being added still, but the energy is being used to weaken or sever the intramolecular forces, right? So the temperature itself does not go up because temperature is only going to increase with kinetic energy or vice versa. But you can still have an increase in the, the delta S value. So this is just showing you that it does go up. But we get a huge spike here in your entropy because your molecules now are going from that solid to the liquid. And then as you begin to heat the liquid up, there is more movement because you have more kinetic energy, right? 
So more kinetic energy means more disorder. More kinetic energy equals more disorder. More movement. So you have very high increases in delta S when you're going from the solid to the liquid or from the liquid to the gas. All right, just another Boltzmann distribution curve, which we've explained before. But your number of particles doing the same thing is uh, inconsistent. Like they all do something different than one another, but on average at 250 Kelvin, this number of particles energy is increasing. Remember we talked about this? We talked about if we turned, I don't know what we did in this class. But the Boltzmann distribution curves just indicate that not everything is going to be doing the same thing, right? As temperature increases, kinetic energy increases also. And so then your entropy values would be increasing uh, when you're adding heat. So you get a higher positive S because kinetic energy is increasing. Just think about if, like, we're in this room and we're dancing, and then we start dancing crazy, there's a lot more disorder, right? So kinetic energy makes us move more. More movement gives us more disorder. All right, positive when you have volume increases. I, I get that right now. You guys are just, like, listening to me. You have no idea what's happening. But when I give you all these questions, every question is going to say, is entropy increasing, decreasing? And then apply that to figure out if Gibbs free energy is increasing or decreasing. So you have to understand what conditions allow for something to be positive or negative, And then you'll apply it. So when you have volume increases, that increases entropy. So if I take you guys and I shove you into a little cabinet, all of you, there's not much movement, right? But when I give you the ability to be free to move in this room, then there's lots more disorder because your arrangements and your movement has increased. Got it? All right, calculating delta S. This is simple. The only way to calculate delta S, well, there's two ways, I suppose, but the only way that you're going to calculate it is using this equation, and it's given to you on the exam. So it's the same thing that you did for delta H. You just take your products, you minus subtract your reactants, and you find these values in a table, or they're going to be given to you. So one of the key things is that your delta S value is always going to be given to you in joules per Kelvin whoops, mole. Always in joules. When you calculate your answer, it will be given to you, or you will calculate it in joules. All right, so let's take this for example. Calculate delta S for the following reaction at 298 Kelvin. So you're going to take all the information that you've done before for delta H and you just plug it in. So it's your products times one mole minus your reactants, N2 and O2. N2 and O2, if we did this for delta H, would be what? What value? Zero. But there is an entropy value with these because obviously oxygen gas and nitrogen gas have movement and there's certainly disorder in their particles. So you will have values for all of these. So it's just going to show you the quick example. You throw it all in and you get joules per Kelvin mole. We are going to use the delta S value in our next few equations. The most important thing that you recognize constantly is that this is in joules. Because when you go to plug this answer in, what did I tell you that H is typically in? Always in. It's going to be in kilojoules. And when you combine H and S, they have to be in the same units, and you are always going to use kilojoules. So when you calculate S, it'll always be in joules, and then you always have to convert it to kilojoules. I'll definitely show you that, though, in the next few slides. All right, before you start this problem, though, and you even look at the value, does this make sense to you? You should think that before you start problems. If I didn't ask you for a specific number and I just said to you, is this positive or negative for delta S, what would you predict? Why would you predict negative? I mean, we see it's negative. Go ahead. Because they're going together to form something, and they'll form at tighter like, bonds, so they'll have less energy. Okay, that's possible, but I could throw a coefficient on here, say that's 10, and it could just be more stuff. So what you're looking for, first thing, is state change. Do you have a state change going from your reactants to products? Nope. So what do you see as the number of particles you have on the left side and the number of particles you have on the right? 
You have three moles of gas on the left, because there's one here and two here, so that's three moles of gas on the left. That went to one mole of gas on the right. So you had three particles moving around, and then all of a sudden you get one particle moving around. So less disorder, and so therefore delta S is going to be negative, because that's not favorable, right? It's a decrease in entropy. So if it's a decrease in entropy, it's negative. If it's an increase in entropy, it's positive. So when you calculate your values, you should know before you start, be smart before you start. Answer the questions for yourself before you start on what should they be. And then when you do your calculations, you can figure that out. Kind of like that calorimetry stuff. If you know the temperature of your water is increasing, then you know the reaction is exothermic. So before you do your data and calculate anything, you should know you're getting a negative sign for your reaction. Same thing with this. You should know you're getting a negative sign because you looked at the information before you started. All right, so how can you tell if a process is thermodynamically favored? Like, will a reaction occur? That's what we're getting to. All of this is to figure out whether or not we can have a reaction occur. So first thing, I already wrote it, is that delta H is negative, so it's exothermic. And then more disorder is favorable, and so it's positive. But the final result of this is that we're going to look at whether or not we have an overall reaction that produces uh, a favorable process. So there's two ways to do it. The first one is finding delta S of the universe, which is impossible for us to do. So I'm going to explain this to you because you need to understand it, but we will never, ever do this, and scientists don't do this because we can't measure the universe. Can we? We can only measure what's inside our beakers and possibly like on the little bit of the outside of the beaker, but if I lose any heat to the universe, how do I figure out how much heat is out there? You never can. So what we'll use predominantly is Gibbs free energy, and this is really the equation that we're going to focus on. So let me explain to you if we can figure out the entropy of the universe, because I said the entropy of the universe is always increasing, right? So if I could figure out that the universe increased, then I would say that my reaction is thermodynamically favored. But I just explained how impossible that would be, right? So we have our system, which is our reaction, right? Wherever the reaction is occurring, that happens in some system. I usually draw a dot for it because you typically can't see it, right? As a reaction, you can't see those little molecules. But my surroundings is where the heat's released or absorbed into. The universe is the combination of all of that. So in other words, the combination of this system plus what happens to the surroundings tells me whether or not this will be, occur spontaneously. Sort of like you cleaning your room. You cleaning your room is your system. Your room is your system. You're creating more order. That's not favorable. Agreed? But the overall process of you releasing heat while you're cleaning that is favorable. So the favorable process outweighs the non-favorable process and the entropy of the universe increases. If that didn't happen, you would never be able to clean your room. That would never be possible that you could provide order to your room. But because the amount of heat that's released to the surroundings outweighs the heat that, or the uh, disorder that was um, decreased in your system or you cleaning your room, then the process is favorable. Does that make sense? You have to combine the two of them. So if I'm doing a reaction here, I have to measure everything on the outside of the system, which is almost impossible to do because you can lose heat all the time. You can't really measure all of that. So if you were able to do this, you would use this equation. The entropy of the universe is equal to the entropy of the system plus the entropy of the surroundings. And if the entropy of the universe increases, then the reaction is going to be thermodynamically favored, but we can't possibly do that. So this is just showing you exactly what I just explained before. If heat goes out into your surroundings, then it would be an increase of entropy. So entropy of the surroundings would be greater than zero. And this is not a negative sign. Put a dot here because it makes it look like it's negative delta and negative S. It's just saying if S of the surroundings increases, then S is positive. If S of the surroundings decreases, then S is negative because the heat's going into the system. It's just showing you how to relate delta H and S, right? If heat goes from the surroundings into the system, that's creating less order in my surroundings, which means that that becomes a negative value. Do you understand that? If heat goes out into the surroundings, then that creates more disorder and S is positive. 
the questions that you're going to read are going to explain stuff like that to you. It'll say heat was released from this reaction, and you have to figure out what is delta H and what is delta S. So if a process increases the entropy of the system, N is exothermic. It's just showing you your values here. It would be positive. It would be positive. It must also be thermodynamically favored because the entropy of the universe would increase. I'm going to just kind of skip through these because we're not going to use them. This is what we're going to use, Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy is a measure of how much work or how much energy is available to do work. So this measures free energy available to do work. You can think of this almost like lifting weights, right? So if I have in my muscles energy available to lift my weights, at some point, right, if I just keep lifting weights and lifting and lifting, eventually I don't have any more energy, right? There comes a point where you're not going to be able to lift anymore. I have no more energy available to do work. So you could have energy available to do work, or you could have no energy available to do work, and the process doesn't happen, right? I'm just not going to be, if I try to lift Argo up, I don't have energy available to do work. Get it? So some processes will happen if there's energy available, or some processes won't because there's not energy available. This equation is given to you on the exam, and it utilizes delta H and delta S. My favorite equation ever. It's right here. So, and it'll be yours too in just one more day. All right, so delta G is always in kilojoules. Delta H is always in kilojoules. But delta S is going to be given to you in joules. So you have to convert this to kilojoules. So I labeled this because it's so common that you guys refuse to do this. On your test, I will write on your test that you are a joule fool because it's the only reason why you get these problems wrong. They're not hard to do. You will absolutely understand this lecture when we're through with it. The only thing that you will forget to do is to not be a jewel fool. So I would suggest, even on your test, to write on your paper, don't be a jewel fool. It has literally prevented people from getting hundreds on just this test, because this test is really doable. Most people love thermodynamics when we're done with it. And it is simply that one thing that causes the problem. All right, so make sure that you convert to kilojoules. So you divide by 1,000 when you're doing that, right? There's 1,000 joules in one kilojoule. So let's just remind ourselves that in one kilojoule. All right, so if delta G is negative, that means that there is energy available to do work, and so it will be a thermodynamically favored process, which means the reaction will occur. The reaction won't occur if delta G is positive. So this is the overall way of figuring this out. If a reaction will occur, delta G must be negative. So there's available energy. This means that the reaction will happen. The reaction will happen. And then also, uh, by the way, temperature has to be in Kelvin because the units for S are joules per Kelvin mole. So I just explained all this to you. This is the energy used to create disorder. This is the energy transferred as heat. And this is the amount of energy available to do work. All right, so there's two methods for calculating delta G. You could use the equation that I just showed you. And the way that you're going to calculate delta H is how many ways? Four. What's the first one? First one you learn. Bond enthalpies, where I literally draw C, double bond C, and you draw the structures, and you do what equation? Bonds broken minus bonds formed. You have to know this, right? 
So you have those uh, four ways. What's the next one? Calorimetry, right? Q equals MC delta T. What's the next one? Hess's law. And the last? Enthalpies of formation, right? So you can use all four of those. This left off our first one, which is bond enthalpies. So bond enthalpies are uh, bonds broken minus bonds formed. Calorimetry is Q equals MC delta T. Hess's law, you just combine them. So you sum them. Sum them means you add them up once you're done. And enthalpy of formation is going to be your H, H of F products minus your HF reactants. That's just a reminder how you find them all. Then when you find your delta S values, I'll pause so you can finish writing that. You find your delta S values how? Have I taught you any other way than one way? Just today, right? Because the only equation I gave you was S of your products minus S of your reactants. That's it. So I have to give you a table of values on the exam for you to do that. So again, super easy to do as long as you don't mess up the math. It's S of your products minus S of your reactants, right? The sum of them. So S products, and you have that equation on your sheet, minus S reactants. So then you calculate delta G by plugging in your numbers, and then you make sure you convert joules to kilojoules. That's it. Really a simple equation to use. Or the last thing that you're going to do is you'll use delta G of formation values, which again is super simple because it's like delta H of formation and it's like delta S of formation. So you just keep using products minus reactants each time and you'll get the right answers. All right. So let's try. Very, very simple question. Find delta G for a reaction if delta H is negative 218 kilojoules and delta S equals negative 765 joules per Kelvin at 32 degrees Celsius. Is the reaction thermodynamically favored? So before you start, be smart. What am I asking you to do? Stop, 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 stop. Look up here. Figure out what your sign should be before you start. Because if you have a calc error, you'll know it before you start. Is delta H thermodynamically favored? Yes, because it's exothermic. It's negative, right? Is delta S thermodynamically favored? No. So when you're looking at this process, actually, it's negative, so it's not thermodynamically favored. When you're looking at this process, you can... Kind of show yourself before you start, should I have a positive or should I have a negative? Now this one is questionable, but sometimes they will give you a negative and a positive value, and you'll know right away, those are both thermodynamically favored, so delta G must be negative. Do you see how you can just analyze that? This one, yes, you will have to do some math, and one will outweigh the other. Do you agree? Because one process is thermodynamically favored and the other is not, so this is your system and your surroundings sort of competing for each other. Who's going to win for the universe? All right, now you can solve. Okay, so you plug in negative 218 minus, and then this all goes in like a big parentheses, right? You have to multiply your temperature times your delta S value. That should make sense to you too because of that Boltzmann distribution curve that I showed you, that if you increase temperature or decrease temperature, that will change the disorder of your products, right? And then I had to convert to kilojoules because I'm not a joule fool. So you divide that by 1,000. Then you calculate, and you should get negative, I'm sorry, positive 15.3 kilojoules. Is this process thermodynamically favored? No, because there's not free energy available to do work. They will ask you that often, and you guys need to recognize that you still have to answer a question not just leave the number there. Agreed? Like if I say, is this thermodynamically favored, and you just write positive 15.3, you don't get full credit because you have to write, no, this is not thermodynamically favored because there is no energy available to do work. That's what you need to write. Delta G is positive, and there is no energy available to do work. I will write that here for you so that you remember that. No available energy to do work. 
So that's your justification. It's a positive value. Any questions? OK. Uh, so this means what process here outweighed the other process? The entropy. The fact that the entropy was not favorable outweighed the fact that the enthalpy was favorable, right? Delta H, again, remember, is enthalpy. So you have enthalpy and entropy. All right, at what temperature does this reaction become thermodynamically favored? Because if I change the temperature, I could get the reaction to become spontaneous by changing the amount of disorder there is in these products. So this is how you solve this problem. And they do ask this on the AP exam. At what temperature would it become thermodynamically favored? When does delta G become thermodynamically favored? When it's negative. So if I figure out what the temperature is at zero, when delta G is zero, everything will be thermodynamically favored for that temperature or, I guess, uh, below it or above it. I've got to think about that. Uh, I guess I have to look at the temperature. If it goes down, then it'll be favorable for everything that goes below it. If the temperature goes up from the previous example, it would be favorable for everything that goes above it. Make sense? So that's what you're going to look for is if the temperature changes an increase or decrease. So you set this equal to zero. And if I set delta G equal to zero, then your algebra becomes zero equals delta H minus T delta S, right? So I have to subtract out delta H. So I have negative delta H over here equals negative T delta S. And I'm trying to find T. So I divide by delta S, divide by delta S. So then my negative delta H over delta S is equal to negative T. My negatives will cancel. All right, so then your equation is this. You will get multiple choice questions that you will hate that show you these rearrangements of these equations and ask you like something about this, like where the temperature becomes thermodynamically favored. And you have to rearrange and utilize this equation to get there. I'll show you some of those examples. So then you're just going to plug in your values here, and then you'll solve for the equation uh, to find the temperature. So the temperature is 285. What was it in the previous example? 305, right? So all temperatures below this will be thermodynamically favored. Does that make sense? And so as the temperature is decreasing, this should make sense to you too, look. This was your negative value here. As the temperature goes down, what happens to this overall value? It becomes less positive. Because notice in the delta G, in the example that we solved, it was a positive value, right? We don't want positive, we want negative. So as T, this number T, starts to decrease, a negative times a negative gives me a positive. We knew that this was negative, right, in the previous example. But this one outweighed this one, didn't it? So my overall delta G was positive in the previous example. But as I decrease the temperature and I lower it and I lower it, eventually this negative times this negative is going to be such a small positive that delta H negative will outride, outweigh that one. And it'll override it and you'll become negative. Do you understand that? If not, we're going to do it again in the next slide. You guys are powering through. You're doing well. Almost near the end. All right. You could memorize this slide and probably forget about it when May comes, or you could understand how this equation works, and I know you can do that. So this is asking you, without numbers, can you figure out if a process is thermodynamically favored or not? And if it isn't, at what conditions will make it thermodynamically favored? That's what the multiple choice questions will ask you. So what set of conditions make this process thermodynamically favored? And you have to evaluate temperature. So this all has to do with temperature. So the equation that you're using right here is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. I would take an enormous amount of notes on this slide because this is one thing that really slips students up in trying to understand how to answer this. If I have a negative delta H and a positive delta S, look how this works. This is negative times t positive, what will this value always be? Negative, because a negative times a positive is always a negative. Does it matter what the temperature is? 
No, as long as it's certainly not zero, right? And you know that at, at zero Kelvin, there is no entropy, there's no movement. So there's zero entropy at that point too. So if negative times a positive will always give me a negative, then I have a negative and a negative, and I will always get a negative, so this will always be thermodynamically favored at all temperatures. Understood? Always. If, however, I have a positive value for delta H, and I have a negative value for delta H, a negative times a negative gives me a positive, correct? Doesn't matter what the temperature is, no matter what, I will have a positive plus a positive, and I will always have non-thermodynamically favored at all temperatures. Do you agree? Okay. I'm going to write it over here so that you can see this on this piece. So when you answer these questions, I would write the equation out. I wouldn't try to do it in my head. I would literally put the, the symbols in there. So if I have a negative and a negative here, right, what will happen to this is that you could either have a thermodynamically favored process or a non-thermodynamically favored process, right? We just saw that in the other example. We're not sure because... This is thermodynamically favored, so we're happy about this one, but this is not thermodynamically favored, so we're sad about that one, and we have to figure out at what conditions will this outweigh it, because we just learned that temperature can change that, right? All right, so say for yourself, put a T here, and this is negative. Negative times a negative will give me a positive value, right? So at what temperature, though, low or high, will this get outweighed by the positive, the uh, the thermodynamically favored delta H. Low or high temperature? So I want my positive to be low or high. Big or small, I should say. I want my positive to be small. Because the smaller it is, the better chance I have of the negative sign outweighing that, right? These are going to be numbers, but we're not going to get numbers. So I have a negative, and then from this, I'll end up with what I want is a small positive. And the way that you get that is at low T. But if I have a negative with a big positive, that's going to be from high T, right? This situation will give me a negative delta G, which would be favorable. This situation would give me a positive delta G, which would not be favorable. Do you understand that? That's what this slide says. Thermodynamically favored at low temperatures, but not thermodynamically favored at high temperatures. So to really understand it, you plug in your positive and negative signs to evaluate it, or you memorize the slide every time. Questions on that? All right, you try the next scenario. Like, just thoughtfully figure that out while you're looking at it. So you're going to put delta G equals delta H minus TS, and you say for yourself, this is positive and this is positive. This is not thermodynamically favored. This is thermodynamically favored. Depending on temperature, it can be favorable overall. So figure out if the temperature should be low or high and whether or not that would be favorable. Okay. So if this is not favorable, and this is a negative times T positive, I need temperature to be what? High or low? High. To give me a big negative. Yeah. Right? So if this gets big, then a negative times a positive will give me a big negative when T is high. So I want high temperatures to give me a thermodynamically favored process, because that big negative will override this positive. And then I'll get an overall negative for my delta G. Makes sense, right? You just have to sort of apply yourself to those questions and figure it out. All right. You have delta H. You have delta S. You have this reaction. Is this process thermodynamically favored? Justify your answer. Are there numbers? Nope. So evaluate this. Two ways. I want you to evaluate it. So you're looking at your signs. I 
I guess really we can only evaluate it one way because they didn't give you a ton of information, but I guess two ways would be appropriate. Like one with words and one with signs. Brian, give me one. And so what will you say about that? Both are favorable. Therefore, according to delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, delta G will be negative. You have to write all of that. You can't just say it's negative and positive. So that would be included in your justification. You would say delta H is negative, delta S is positive. That's what Brian said. And according to the equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, delta G would therefore be negative, and so this process is favorable. Because this is favorable, and this is favorable, but we're really determining if whether or not this process is. And the process has to do with Gibbs free energy. Will the reaction occur is Gibbs free energy. Not H, not S. Those are just contributing factors. S and H are the system and the surroundings total. Delta S of the universe we can't really measure, so we use Gibbs free energy instead. Oh, uh, what's another way? Yeah. Perfect. So we have two moles of gas to three moles of gas, so we know that disorder is increased, right? Even regardless of the positive sign that it gave me, I know that disorder is increased. And what else can I say about this reaction using words? It is what? Exothermic. And I know that because of the negative sign, but those are the words, not necessarily the equation. Exothermic re reactions are favorable, and more disorder is favorable, which you can see from the reaction itself. So it's just showing you those. All right, last section here is calculating delta G from delta G of F values. If you are asked to find Gibbs free energy using delta G of formation values, you should cheer because that's so easy. All you're doing is products minus reactants. Every time you see those tables, that's like a freebie on the exam, and they're just making sure that you can do math and that you're using your units correctly. Delta G will always be in kilojoules. Uh, it shows you the free energy change that occurs when one mole of a compound is made from its elements in their standard states. Remember, standard state conditions are what? 25 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere. That's important because if it gives you those equations or if it gives you that information with a little not symbol, when you, it may ask you to go back and calculate H or S, agreed? And it won't tell you the temperature. It'll give you this little sign because it will give you, all right, I'm just posing this question. Say I ask you to do this. Now you have a delta G value, some number you have. Uh, but then I gave you like another scenario in which you calculated then you calculated delta H, not number, you calculated delta H. Now you have two pieces of information, and then the third part of the AP question says, now calculate delta S. So if you were to go to calculate delta S, you would use delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, wouldn't you? And you would be missing that piece of information and staring at the problem not knowing where to find it. But you find it because that little not symbol tells you it's 25 degrees C. You understand that? All right, so very simple. You just throw in your products, your reactants, and your coefficients, and you solve. Oh, and delta G formation values are zero for elemental form. So the only time that they're not is for what? Delta S. Delta S, entropy. And that should make sense because there's movement in elemental form atoms, right? They're moving. So here's just the showing you the same exact thing that we've done before. You just take your moles, you multiply the products, and you solve, and here's the answer, negative 838 kilojoules per mole. The only way that we could do this in class is if I give you the table of values and I ask you to go look them all up. So you're going to use the same thing. I'll post uh, a slide on Google Classroom so that you can go and look them up and find your actual values. We won't do that, though, very often um, for this lecture. All right, almost there. I touched on this in the beginning. I said that a thermodynamically favored process doesn't mean that it's fast. That's kinetics. If something is happening, but over a really, really, really long time, and it's not at a measurable rate, we call this kinetic control. You would say that a reaction is under kinetic control 
if it's occurring, but you can't even measure how fast it's occurring. Like, for example, a bike rusting. That takes a very long time for your bike to rust, right? So to measure that is just too long. We say it's under kinetic control, but it's happening. So we don't say that things are fast. We just say that they will happen. Um, and that's what oxidizing is showing you, that it's thermodynamically favored, but it could take several hundred years for an iron beam to rust away. So it's under kinetic control. Um, this is showing you that when you have a process that is positive, which means it's not thermodynamically favored, you can use external energy to make the process occur. And so we've discussed that in the very beginning of this lecture. This is just showing you a few different ways. So electric electricity can be used to recharge a battery. So the battery could be dead, which means that delta G is zero. There's no energy available to do work. It just stops. The battery's dead. And we'll touch on this when we get to electrochemistry. That's another section where we'll include delta G. Um, but you can supply energy to that to remove electrons from atoms and then create free energy. Same thing with this glucose. Uh, the conversion of carbon dioxide and water to glucose through photosynthesis happens in multiple steps where they absorb photons from the sun. And this is just showing you how you can combine them. But, you know, this is in bio class, so I'm going to leave this all for you to just read on your own. Just giving you application for it. And that's the end. You made it with like a few minutes shy.